Each person that we talk to is so different and I think that's what I'm really enjoying about this process is that it's surprising me. It's surprising me a lot. I didn't expect to sit here and feel energized necessarily because, you know, this topic is, it's got its ups and downs for me and it's, it's a bit intimidating to talk to somebody new that's, you know, a trailblazer for made in BC, on the island, in Victoria, throughout Canada. It's a really big deal to speak with Stephanie. My name is Stephanie Green and I'm a physician in Victoria, British Columbia. I am a maid practitioner and I am the president of the Canadian Association of Maid Assessors and Providers. For 10 years I did general medicine, what we call cradle to grave medicine. Uh, always interested in maternity care and for the next 12 years I actually did um, exclusively maternity and newborn care. But in 2016 I pivoted and changed so now I actually am a maid practitioner. So I help people at the end of life with assisted dying. Essentially, I've always been interested in the intersection between medicine, ethics, and law. Autonomy of patients needs to be respected. I'd like to think I've always practiced in a way that puts a patient at the center of their care throughout whatever type of work I'm doing, uh, whether it was family medicine or maternity care. I still feel like I do that because it's important that patients have a say in what, what happens to them. And so when I saw assisted dying becoming legal, it fit into that mold for me. It kind of drew me in because of that, that aspect of patient autonomy and patient-centered care. In my view, Canada has the best medical assistance in dying legislation in the world. C14 was the law that was passed in 2016 allowing medical assistance in dying. And it said that there were four eligibility criteria, serious and incurable illness, advanced state of irreversible declining capability, a reasonably foreseeable natural death and intolerable suffering. We didn't know what reasonably foreseeable meant. It's not a medical term. And so that actually causes a lot of problems. We eventually ended up uh, as a made community seeing reasonably foreseeable as meaning reasonably predictable from the person's main illness and, and the other illnesses that they have. That's actually gone now from the law as an eligibility criterion. So C7 was the second law that was passed a year ago, pretty much to the day from today. That removed the need for a reasonably foreseeable natural death as an eligibility criterion, and it moved it into a different part of the law. It becomes something that if a person doesn't have a reasonably foreseeable natural death, but they are applying for MAID, additional safeguards come into play. So, for example, a 90-day assessment period, rather than somebody being allowed to actually have a medically assisted death soon after the assessments have been completed. There are some other changes as well, but that was the crucial one alongside something called the waiver of final consent. Before C7 was passed, the person had to have capacity on the day of their medically assisted death. That led to people choosing not to have painkillers or sedatives because they were worried that uh, if they weren't capable because of the action of the drug, they wouldn't be allowed to have a medically assisted death. A person is now allowed to sign a waiver of final consent. So if on the day or beforehand they lose capacity, the medical assistance in dying provider may still go ahead. I had the opportunity to go to Amsterdam and attend a conference in May of 2016. Uh, a month before our law changed. And I, I went there because I was educating myself about the topic and I was still finalizing my decision to get involved. I wanted to learn more about it. And I went kind of with two colleagues from Victoria, expecting to meet a lot of Canadians as our law was just about to change. In fact, there was very few of us there. It was a very, very small group. Uh, there, were, there were eight of us actually, but six of us in particular kind of got together and met each other while we were there. We were from different cities and um, were quite 
surprised to be in this place doing this this new thing and learning about this new field of care. And after the conference, when we came back, we stayed in touch with each other, those six people, and very quickly branched out to include a few other colleagues that we knew were starting to do this work and wanted to be doing this work and weren't able to attend the conference. So we had this kind of core group of people um, for the very first days when uh, assisted dying became legal. So as we took our first steps into this big unknown, we at least had this little group of colleagues, this professional support, and it proved invaluable. You know, I might learn from Dr. Regler in Comox or Dr. Weeb in Vancouver. And by the same virtue, you know, when I did my first procedure, I could tell them how it went and what it felt like. And we could discuss where to get the IV tubing and what to say to the funeral director. I mean, we were all encountering all these new firsts. Everything was new for all of us. It's actually a matter of great pride to us that of the eight providers in British Columbia, who were ready to work as the law changed, two of the eight were in the Comox Valley. Our health authority was very forward thinking. They did not wait for the law to change in order to start planning for this change. Most jurisdictions in Canada waited for the law, C-14, in June of 2016, and then began that process. So we were already a little bit ahead, uh, particularly on Vancouver Island, but in British Columbia in general. Vancouver Island is a unique place. I, I think that all of British Columbia is a little bit special. We know from national data that uh, in 2020, for example, uh, only 2.5% of all annual deaths in Canada were attributed to an assisted death. Um, by comparison, we know in the state of Oregon or the state of Washington, where this has been going on for 20 years, Oregon in particular, the rates of assisted dying are far, far less, under 1%. Um, they have a much more restrictive law. You need to be terminally ill. You need to be dying within six months. Uh, you can only have a self-administered death. There's a lot of restrictions, uh, and I think that has partly to do with their low numbers. Uh, our model is more similar to the European jurisdictions, like in the Netherlands or Belgium. They've also been practicing assisted dying for almost 20 years now. Uh, and their model is more like ours in that it encompasses clinician-administered care as well as self-administered care. Um, so I think we could maybe compare to those jurisdictions more accurately. And their rates are between 4 and 4.5% 4 .5 of all deaths annually. So I think five or six years in, to see Canadian data at 2.5% of all deaths, which is a very small number, uh, is kind of what's to be expected. Um, and I, I do think over time we may possibly expand to the same type of uh, numbers that we see in Europe. I think that's not wholly unreasonable. British Columbia, however, is a bit of an outlier. So compared to most provinces, we're doing more. 4% uh, of all deaths in British Columbia are attributed to an assisted death. Uh, that's probably double most provinces. Um, and Vancouver Island is actually the engine of all of that. Uh, so Comox Valley and Victoria, in fact, the two poles, uh, have a, a very high uptake of assisted dying. Uh, last year's numbers are actually over 7%. The reasons are probably complex, but the simple answer is that MAID was discussed right from the very beginning in public as the law changed. It was actually quite difficult. We had a local hospital that was Catholic and so prohibited medical assistance in dying and even tried at the beginning to prevent us from carrying out assessments of patients uh, in the hospital uh, who wanted to have a medically assisted death. I was actually a hospital board appointed member of St. Joseph's Hospital's ethics committee and I felt that that was an untenable position. I couldn't in all conscience be on the ethics committee of a hospital that prohibited medical assistance in dying, so I resigned. I didn't resign my privileges at the hospital, my patients um, were still in the hospital and at that time I wanted to continue providing for them there. Also, uh, it was important to me that um, I kept a presence at the hospital as a maid provider, um, so I wanted to make sure that my colleagues all knew about medical assistance in dying. And there was a lot of education at the time of colleagues about medical assistance in dying. When you achieve a certain level of something happening in a community, whatever it is, more people know about it. Uh, and they they know that it's okay to ask about it because they've heard that somebody down, you know, maybe a family member or a neighbour uh, 
or somebody they know through somebody else has had a medically assisted death. And so it becomes not secret. There was no support at all from nurses because they weren't allowed to work with us. And so I, for example, who hadn't placed an IV, an intravenous cannula, for probably approaching 20 years had to train again to do that. Uh, and of course, uh, well, maybe you don't realize, but people who are very sick uh, can often, it can be very difficult to place an IV. But nonetheless, we managed to do that. What happened in 2017, what, however, was that the hospital, St. Joseph's, closed and a new secular hospital opened in the valley. The change was extraordinary. So I already knew that lots of colleagues, and particularly lots of nursing colleagues, completely supported medical assistance in dying. They just weren't able to help us because of the prohibition that St. Joseph's put on them. Um, I mean, I, I had had uh, hospital porters coming up and shaking my hand, thanking me for what I was doing with medical assistance in dying. But when we moved to the new hospital, the staff were extraordinarily supportive. Suddenly, we had lots of nurses who wanted to help us with medical assistance in dying. Um, they knew that it was difficult for us, um, just working by ourselves, and that we needed support, and they supported us. The, the pharmacy, uh, one of the concerns was that you know, perhaps um, the, pharmacy, the pharmacists in the pharmacy would not be willing to uh, provide medication. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. We got huge support from the pharmacy. The hierarchy, the, the, administrator, the senior administrators, bent over backwards to help us, and still do. Uh, we can admit people at very short notice to the hospital. People who are, for some reason, unable or unwilling to have a medically assisted death at home. The hospital administrators are very supportive and we could admit people at short notice to a hospital bed for uh, them to have a medically assisted death. It was quite remarkable and I am absolutely certain that in most of the other hospitals in Canada that Prohibit made, the great majority of the staff, just like the great majority of Canadians, pretty much 85% of Canadians support medical assistance in dying and there's no reason to believe that it's any different uh, as far as support by staff in uh, hospitals that Prohibit made is concerned. The main issue was one of workload, to be honest. There were, although there were two of us in the valley, um, this is something that a lot of people were waiting for. After hearing Jonathan talk about the hospital that was faith-based, I asked to speak with a local reverend from the Comox United Church who provides services for those who were choosing a path of maid. In the United Church, we've never shied away from controversial topics, and, and we have a real heart for justice. So I, I think in a lot of ways, for, the, for, for Comox United in particular and for the larger United Church, there's an element of this being a justice issue, that if people are in pain and people know they're dying, they should be allowed to make that choice. I'm Reverend Kelty Van Binsbergen, and I was in ministry at Comox United Church from 2015 until just recently at the start of 2022. And my role there uh, changed a little bit during my time, but obviously involved leading worship and Bible study and those sorts of things. And also involved what we call pastoral care. So that's being with people um, in times of difficulty, people needing to talk about anything that's happening in their lives. And um, at Comox and in previous churches, because um, I've been in ministry for 25 years, so I've, I've done a lot of pastoral care over the years and particularly accompanying people in times of illness. The difficulty for the provider is that we, we must be very careful that we don't see our role as advocating for medical assistance in dying for that person. 
advocating for medical assistance in dying for a community, for changes that are appropriate in the country, yes, but not an individual. It must be the individual's choice. We can help them. We can help them. We can help by talking to them about what's happening in their family and what their family member is doing and why. We can try and see it from the point of view of the family member, talk to the family member. Sometimes it's religious. That can be very difficult because those beliefs tend often to be held regardless of anything else. With the church knowing that this was becoming a legal possibility, they wanted to be on board with that from the beginning and be a part of letting letting the community know about it. And, and, and I think people being aware that, that there was a church that was okay with it, so that people who might hesitate would know, okay, there there is at least one group out there who are spiritual, who are religious, I think even more than spiritual, who, 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 who are okay with this. These interviews have been incredible. But what I really didn't consider was the kinds of people we need in place. In order to help MAID be an option for people like my grandma, it really does take a passionate kind of person who truly cares. These people are actively looking to make a difference for their patients, their families, and to offer end-of-life care for Canadians that need it and qualify for it. I wanted to find out more about what makes someone want to provide this service and what they want people and families to know. I want people to know that the people that do this work do not take it lightly. I've heard opponents talk about coercion and frivolous decisions and things that I disagree with that I don't think are happening. I want people to know that the few clinicians that do this work take it very seriously. We feel the weight of responsibility of this work. For whatever reason, society has granted us this position, this authority to make these decisions with you, to help establish your eligibility for MAID, to be in the position of the person that you come to at this moment in your life when you need or feel that you need this care. And we feel the weight of responsibility. Let me tell you, this is the only medical care that I'm aware of that is outlined in the criminal code of this country. If I get this wrong, I'm liable to criminal prosecution. I'm, I'm liable to spend 15, 14 years in jail. That is not something I take lightly. That is not anything any of my colleagues take lightly. I'd like to think, you know, when we act in good faith, that kind of prosecution won't happen, but it's something we think of every single time we see a patient. I don't know anyone who does this work frivolously. I don't know anyone who's looking to push that boundary frivolously. I don't know anyone who wants to go to jail to prove a point. There's a rigorous system out there. We work within it. We have endless discussions and debates and educational events and speak to scholars and academics and learn from each other. We take this work seriously. And it is a huge privilege to be in this position. And we thank our patients for inviting us into that position. But please don't think we take it lightly. I started doing maid work in what is clearly uh, the uh, latter part of my career. But it's actually proved to be probably the most meaningful work that I've ever done. I think it has helped me start conversations about end of life. It's easy to preach, but hard to do. It's easy for me to say people should be having these conversations and I see why. But it actually took me a couple years of doing this work before I did it myself, to be honest. Um, it has given me that, the ability to, or the, the understanding of the need of those conversations, as awkward as they are. So it has given me that. I've always done a lot of palliative care because I have a lot of elderly patients. And that's always been very important. But the fact that I can now do this work and end suffering for certain because a patient wants it so and that I can interact in the most remarkably personal way with a patient and their family. I mean, it really is very intimate work. Palliative care is too, but it's especially intimate when you're talking to somebody uh, about their desire 
to end suffering through having a medically assisted death. So that's really why it's so meaningful. I think it's internally helped me focus on what brings meaning to my life? Who are the people that are meaningful to me and why? And once I've thought about that, have I spoken to those people recently? Like, have I told them that they're meaningful to me and why? So it's kind of pushed me to the next level of um, making the effort, not just saying it, not just thinking it, not just sorting it out internally, but taking the next step, silly as this might sound. I am not one for big celebrations for myself. It's not really been a part of my life or how I've lived it for whatever reason. But when I turned 50 a couple of years ago, it occurred to me that I should celebrate. And I, um, I wanted to do that not because I wanted to celebrate myself, of course I did, but um, I really wanted to invite and gather the people who were super important in my life in getting me to 50 and making me who I am and bringing that richness to my life. I wanted them to gather with me so that I could thank them. And for me, that's what that party was about. And so I think I wouldn't have done that if I wasn't a maid practitioner. Uh, so that's one of the gifts it's given me. After I've provided a medically assisted death, I like to go with the nurse to have a cup of coffee and sit and separate it from my other work, not just go rush off to do the next thing. We talk about the family that we've just seen. We talk about the patient. Very often the patient's strength and fortitude. Sometimes something that you know, one of the family members said and, and the fact that, you know, how remarkable but wonderful it is that there's often a lot of laughter at the time as people tell stories. But I do like to separate it from the rest of my work. In, in, in sort of terms of actual timing and put some separation in, during which time I enjoy the, you know, if you like, enjoy the company of another person who's, who's been with me doing that work, um, talking about it, uh, but also just uh, allowing ourselves to decompress perhaps after it. I've spent a lot of time during this process thinking about what the experience was like for me and my family. But what really stood out was hearing from these professionals on how their work affects them. Of course it strikes a chord. This is deeply meaningful work. How could you not project yourself and your life onto the person you're helping? Because this procedure is still so new to Canadians, the need for resources might not be fully explored. The truth is, this affects people deeply. The patient, the family members there, the friends who weren't there, the providers, those who never knew. People need support in this industry because it's still such a unique experience. Through this journey, I was lucky enough to find out about some of the readily available services out there waiting to help many.